that you gave the last uh, lecture of this um, series of uh, lecture on uh, the carbon neutrality. And my name is Fei Cheng. I'm a associate professor uh, from Institute of Energy, Environment, and Economy, Tsinghua University. And today we will discuss about the international and national governance on climate change and carbon neutrality. Uh, firstly, most of you already heard about the previous uh, seven lectures on different topics. And we know that from Professor Luo Yong's lecture that uh, climate change is the largest crisis that we are facing. And also, you know from Professor Wang Chan's lecture that we do have the technology in our hand to deal with it. Although most of or some of those technology are not commercially available at this moment, but through invest in uh, technology research and development, we uh, have those um, affordable technology in the future to deal with climate change. And also you must also learn from the lecture by Professor Chao Jing and also Professor Zhang Da on that we do have economic incentives to deal with uh, climate change. And we also do have policy instruments, including the emission trading scheme to reduce our emissions. And you know that from uh, the lecture by Professor He Hebin and also the Professor Tsai Wenjia that we can achieve the mitigation and emission reduction also um, gain the tremendous benefit on environment and health improvement. So we have many regions to do the transition, as you know from the first lecture given by Professor Zhang Xiliang. So uh, in the past seven lectures, we have a lot of arguments which we can take that to persuade ourselves and others to take ambitious action to deal with climate change. But if you look at the uh, figures in these slides, that is the recent emission gap report published by UNEP just before um, the COP26 in this year. And these figures clearly show that there is a emission gap between um, where we should be, which is the two degree or 1.5 degree trajectories and where we are, which is the current policy scenarios or the um, NDC scenarios with enhancement mitigation actions we uh, uh, have that uh, after this call. And you can see that compared with two degree scenarios, there is about more than 10 gigatons emission gap need to be met. And if you look at 1.5 degree scenarios, the gap is even larger. So why we are still not there, given that so many good regions we have that we should be there. And that is the reason why we talk about the governance today with all of you. And by um, governance, or before we talk about the governance, we like to give you an international governance story, which happened just during this um, COP conference uh, in several weeks ago. That you must know from the media about the story on uh, the negotiations, which is about the words phase out co or phase down co. I just compare two texts in these slides. The first one is the final text you can find out in uh, the website, which is on the final outcome of this COP, the Glasgow Climate Pact. And the highlight words is the words about the coal, which says about generally 
um, ask parties to accelerate efforts towards the phase down of the um, abated coal and phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So generally, this means we need to close all of our coal uh, uh, um, uh, to, to reduce uh, stepwise the coal capacity, which the exact means of phase down, and to stop the inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, uh, which is the exact mean of phase out. But if you compare with the um, draft text, which proposed by the chair, before the close of the negotiations, you can see that generally the use of words of phase out and abated coal power instead of um, phase down. And then there is a lot of uh, um, report, media report on this. I quote one from the router which said, China and India, the two biggest producer, consumer, and importer of coal, sparked the last minute drama at the COP26 talks in the Scottish city by forcing a compromise that led from phase out to be changed to phase down. And that is the story that we will analyze throughout this uh, lecture. But before we discuss this, we need to ask several questions to ourselves. Why the coal is the call of this climate negotiation for this year? And why this compromise happens at the very last minute instead of during the negotiations? and why the parties or the countries debate on the words of phase out or phase down. And finally, why it is China and India to insist to use the words phase down instead of phase out. And we will use a framework to analyze the whole story as an example of the governance. Firstly, we'd like to define the governance um, as follows. The first one is the definition on the governance is, we call governance is the structure, processes and actions through which the public and the private actors use to address social goals. So in this definition, we have several key components. The first one is, we have actors that um, the people or the group or the organization which play in this uh, governance. And so who are the actors in the governance? And second components is about the social goal. So what is that social goal and how this goals emerge um, from, from the a society or from the governance structures. And the third component is about how the actor interact with these goals, which could include structure, processes, and actions. And so what are those structures, processes, and actions the actor interact with this goal? And how actor use those structures, processes, and actions to influence goal? That is the framework we will use to analyze the governance. And to imply this analytical structure to our story on coal and China and India, we can see that the actor includes China, India, and other parties in the negotiations. The goal is to negotiate a target on the coal which could be phased out, which could be phased down. And the structure processes and actions, which may include many, we will talk about later, but one of them is definitely the negotiation. So that is the, the, the um, analytical structure we will use to discuss the governance issues. And firstly, let's look at the actors. Um, we need to understand that who act in this governance. And I list some actors in this table, 
which includes, for example, um, the China and India we have talked about in the story, um, they are country actors. Um, and what they can do in this governance structure, they can negotiate each other on legal text and they can make commitment through submission of their target and they can implement their target through domestic actions. And they also can implement the international obligation on reporting, on update their target, so on and so forth. And second um, actors, which is very much important is the political group, which including um, the political parties, the government, and also some um, uh, political groups within different political systems. And those political groups, especially the government, are the most important actors in the governing structure because of they can have huge influence on the target setting and also on the whole governance um, uh, issues. And they can uh, act through uh, passing laws, through adopting strategies, or through uh, issue policies that in um, the whole uh, governance uh, change. For, for example, that China just passed its one plus N strategy package before the COP26, which highlights the China's milestone target on carbon neutrality. And in that regard, China, Chinese government is the political group as actors. And the action is to issue this one plus N strategy package. And also we include others, for example, the citizen groups, um, which includes a different group of uh, citizens, and especially the emerging groups of youth and indigenous people. And the citizen groups can interact with those um, objectives of climate change through different ways. They can interact uh, through a positive way that to change their behaviors and their lifestyles, for example, that to reducing their uh, food waste uh, to contribute to the emission reduction. But, al but also they can lobby the policymakers. Um, but on another hand, they can do some confrontational actions. For example, that the school strikes, um, we will discuss a bit later and to give pressure for policymakers to make actions. And others I will not um, discuss in details, but they are also very important in this uh, governance structure, which includes the corporate actors, the business and industrial associations. They uh, can lobby or they can use their power to shape public views. For example, the, the United States oil companies uh, stand behind those climate skepticism that to deny the climate change, and they are very important. Uh, they were very important um, actors in the governance structure of the United States, and also the non-governmental organization and internet uh, and international government organization that they influence the. Uh, information received by decision makers and citizens and other actors through technical assistance and information dissemination. For example, we uh, present the UNEP's gap report, that is a report by UNEP as IGOs. And also the scientific community is very important because of the climate change is basically a science-based governance, which is built upon the concrete science knowledge. So the scientific research assessment will frame and prioritize the discussion. For example, the IPCC assessment report, you have known this report in previous lectures for many times, and they have huge implication on the governance. And last but not least, which is the media. 
the media is generally a information platform that to shape the climate debate and influence opinions. You read a lot of information from the media, including traditional media of newspaper or social media um, on the web. And those media reports have huge influence on the public opinions on climate change and therefore has influence on the governments. So when we understand that who are actors, we give you example of this school strike movement that you know this little girl, um, the Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, that who starts first climate strike on October 20th of 2018s. At that time, he uh, sit alone that uh, in Friday, uh, in front of the um, Congress building of uh, of her country, and then suddenly, that after just half of a year, it was joined by more than one million participants for the first global climate strike, which has huge influence and gathered a lot of attention on the media, and then. At September of 2019, in the first global week for the future, more than 7.6 million people joined the strike, and which translate this into uh, activists, which has huge influence on the climate and also receive a lot of media report. And in that example, the actor are the citizens and especially the youth. And the action they take is the school strike. And they want to influence the government's objective that to give pressure on the government. And why, why the emerging youth that became a, became a, a emerging citizen group or actors in this government structure, which is in fact very much related to the scientific findings or the scientific um, uh, studies. That this is a paper published by Science just several months ago, which generally um, compare a baby born in 2020 with a people born uh, in 1960s or 70s or previously, and to see what is the difference in terms of climate impact among those two group of people. And the region is very shocking that compared with uh, people born in 70s, 60s or 70s, just like my age, that a baby born this year in 2020 will experience much worse climate impact through his or her life. They generally will suffer two times forest fires, two times of typhoon, three times of floods, five times of crop failure, six times of drought, 36 times of heat waves. And that is basic the scientific reason that why the young people feel angry and why they emerge as actor in this governance structure and to use the track as action to give pressure to the government. And so after discussion of these actors, we move towards the objectives that how those climate ob uh, um, objectives are formed that within the country or in the international arena. We use the United States as a case to show that how objectives are formed. If we look at if we look back to the historical record that how US bring its objectives, signs the signature of the UNFCCC, which is the framework convention on the climate change, which is generally the basic international law, we build our international climate cooperation on. And in during the negotiations of 
the UNFCCC, one of the high priority is the whole developed country world need to negotiate a target collectively. And the proposal is to reduce emission to 1990 levels by the year 2000. But that at that moment, the, U, the United States is very uh, against this idea of uh, setting a target and a timetable. One of the negotiator in United States delegation generally said, we quote here, targets and timetables were a complete red line for Bush ad ad administration. So which means generally 30 years ago, the United States doesn't accept any target and timetable as a target for United States. And so there is a lot of disagreement between United States and European countries, and especially on the words of shell and aim because of the shell will means that that target is mandatory for United States and aim means that will be voluntary. So at the very last that the compromise is aim, which means the emission reduction target to stabilize emission by 2000 is a voluntary target. And that is why at that time, United States can, can sign that um, convention uh, uh, much more easily than today because of that is a voluntary target basically. And even there's no mention on year 2000 and replace that timetable with a more loose and soft wording or return by the end of the present decades. And then enter into the Kyoto Protocol era, which is generally 1997. Um, the mandate to Kyoto Protocol is to negotiate a quantified emission reduction for developed countries. So at that time that uh, United States agree on a target that to reduce 7% of its emission below 1990 level by year 2012. But United States didn't establish a domestic policy process to formalize this target within their own country. But generally that uh, to negotiate this through the ne international negotiations. But when the negotiation team bring that target back to the United States, there is trouble. Because of the House or the Congress didn't want to recognize this. The reason for that is they believe that United States take an unfair target without the same target from developing countries such as China and India. And so they passed the resolution in the Senate, generally says that uh, the, the uh, United States will not agree on any commitment if there is no such similar commitment from developing countries within the same compensation period. And that is why the Kyoto Protocol never got passed in the United States government because of uh, uh, the United States Congress because of that is only covered developed countries emission reduction target. And when the time moves that to the Bush administration, which is during the year 2000s and Bush administration that uh, announced a voluntary target that to reduce the intensity of greenhouse gas of the United States by 18% below 2002 level by 2012. And there is emerging materials that released by the government which shows that the United States oil company play a significant role that in uh, that case because of they discussed with the United States government on which target that the oil company might find acceptable. 
and a stringent target, the, the oil company will not accept because of that will um, have impact on their oil and gas business. And that is how using our previous analytical framework that how this um, business actors influence these objectives uh, in a country. And then in 2009, that when Obama um, take the office of White House in his first term, he's facing the um, uh, negotiations on the Copenhagen Accord, which is generally happens in year 2009. And at, at that time that the Obama together with his colleagues in the Congress that try to uh, move a bill aim to reduce 17% of US emission below 2005 level by 2020. Um, but because of the um, uh, Republic, the Republicans against this target in the Congress. So the United States officially announced this in Copenhagen, but never passed these bills in the Congress again. And even Democratic senators from coal mining and manufacturing states opposite this bill also. And for the Paris Agreement, which is the second term of Obama administration that um, he mobilizes political resource and to announce a climate action plan, which three components. The first one is mitigation. And the second one is adaptation that to increase resilience of the United States. And third one is to um, improve the international leadership of the United States on climate change issues. So the United States formally start a domestic process to prepare its NDC in the late of 2013. And then to consider that to initiate a joint announcement with China, which is also happens in the late of 2013. That is idea from the United States that to start joint announcements with China. And finally, this joint announcement happens in 2014 when President Obama visited Beijing um, and China and US uh, jointly announced this, um, their NDCs for China is to picking uh, the emissions around 2030 and reduce carbon intensity by 60 to 65%. For United States is to reduce the emission by 26 to 28%. And then those, um, those um, target were submitted to the Paris Agreement uh, for the year 2015. So generally, this is a brief history for the how objectives are formed in United States in past uh, two decades. And if, it, if you look through this, you will find that before 2013, there is no formal domestic climate policy for United States. Most of those climate policy came after 2013, and especially in the second term, of Obama administration and why this happened. And we argue that is because of the structure factors shape and constrain the climate governance. If we use United States as an example, that the most two important policy United States has adopted is the first one is the fossil fuel economy standards on the light duty vehicles which generally adopted in the middle of 2000s. And you can see after adoption, there is an improvement of the fuel economy standards in the United States. And that reduced the emission from transportation sector, which accounts for almost one third of the United States emission. And then there is a shale gas revolution also happens almost at the same time, which is mid of uh, 2010s and which increase the production of natural gas in the United States and reduce the natural gas price 
And you can see from the right figure, the red line is the natural gas price in the United States, and the green line is the coal price. And you can see after 2006, the gas price began to decrease in the United States, and right now even lower than coal. And that is why the United States can achieve emission peaking around 2005. And that is why the United States began to take leadership in the international arena that to reduce emission, thanks to those two actions on fuel economy standards and steel gas revolution. So we argue that those structure factors shape and constrain climate governance from the United States example. And that also asks the question why the coal is an issue in the negotiations for this year, generally because of, for example, for developed countries such as United States and European, the natural gas price began to much cheaper than the coal. So based on economic region, the coal could be phased out in developed countries' energy mix. But why China and India insist that to use the words phase down instead of phase out? Because of, you can see that from the figure that which depends on the infrastructure of India and China right now. A huge amount of the infrastructure in China and India still rely on coal. And coal price is much more expensive, uh, is, is much more cheaper than natural gas uh, than natural gas in China and India. So basically, it's difficult for China and India to phase out coal, but much more easier for United States and European Union to phase out coal. And those energy endowment economic structures, which generally developing countries dominated by the heavy industry and develop, uh, uh, developing countries dominated by heavy industry and developed countries dominated by light industry and service and also the infrastructure. We have discussed this and development goals, political systems, value systems. Those are structural factors which shape and constrain the climate governance. And coal Factor, factors constrain different countries to agree or disagree on specific targets in the international negotiation. And also we talk about the infrastructures that um, which also play a role. The left figure shows the advantage mix of the um, electricity generation capacity in United States, China, and India. And generally, the United States coal plant capacity is very old. The average plant age in United States is larger than 40 years. And for China, the average lifetime or the average age is just 11 years. And for India, even younger, less than 10 years. So which means that if we want to phase out coal, then the average lifetime of United States is about 47 years. It's very old. And for China, about 22 years. And for India, less than 20 years. What this means? The power plant generally has operating lifetime more than 30 years. So if we want to phase out coal before their technical time, you, you generally lost the money you invest in those power plants, which we call it um, stranded assets. And because of the power plants in China and India are much, much more younger. So the stranded assets are much more bigger for those two countries, accounting for almost 90% of the global stranded assets and amount to more than $1 trillion. That is basically another reason why the China and India insist on phase down instead of phase out. And after talking about those structure um, factors, we move towards the actions and how the actors can take actions. 
and we use the political group, the government, as another example. And the governments can take many actions. And the most important three of them are laws, strategies, and policies. The laws are generally the legislation on climate change, which set a legal basis for climate actions within a country. And why the climate legislation is important? Because of the climate laws send strong and clear signals for other different actors. It helps to build the consensus and to agree on the expectation in the longer term. And also that send very clear long-term signal for emission reductions, and which is very much important for the business to make long-term planning. And also that legislation reduce the regulatory uncertainty, which the business generally facing. And they prefer certainty so that they can invest in technology to reduce emission. And also the climate laws set up a comprehensive institutions for enforcement, which including the compliance, the responsibilities, who is responsible for what, and also the accountabilities and penalties if there is no uh, compliance. And we have different laws which can relate to the climate change. We categorize them into two parts. One is direct law, another is indirect climate law. And direct climate law is generally to explicitly consider climate as the key objectives. For example, to lease, to reduce greenhouse gas emission as the key objective of that legislation. And we also have other in, uh, indirect uh, climate laws, which in those laws, the climate is not focused, but those laws could have huge implication on the mitigation or adaptation. For example, the renewable energy law, which is focused generally on development of renewables, but that also will have huge implication on reduce um, on reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, it is a uh, indirect law. And the second actions the countries can take is to issue national strategies, and especially when there is no climate laws. The national strategy is generally a portfolio of executive actions which uh, countries can take and which can encourage um, that during the preparation of that strategies, which encourage the, stock the, the um, stakeholder consultation to bring different actors together and to agree on this strategy. And also to link the climate change objectives with other social and economic objectives. This is very important in the context of sustainable development. The, the example is the NDCs. We discussed about that China and other countries submit NDCs to United Nations and also submit low emission development strategies. And those are the example of national strategies. And the red figures shows that evolution of the progress of those actions from year 2007 to year uh, 2017. And you can see more and more countries um, pass the climate laws and also adopt national strategies, including China um, as one example, and also many other Asia developing countries. And another type of action the government actor can take is the policies. Um, I believe that you must know this from previous lecture, and especially from Professor Chao Jing's lecture. The actions, uh, the policy actions could be categorized into three categories. One is on economic instrument, which generally follows a focus on the economic incentives, which could include in the carbon tax, emission trading scheme, subsidies, low guarantees, or tax rebate or credit, whatever. And second part is regulatory instruments, which China always use, including the standards, could be the emission standards, technology standards, or performance standards, or ban on specific technology. For example, to ban the HFC, which is one of the 
um, ODS and also contribute to the greenhouse gas emission. And third category is generally about information policies, the energy laboring and volunteering uh, and voluntary actions and also the research and development um, policies. And another very interesting issue is the form of those objectives that most of countries use the target and timetable. We discussed this in the United States case, which on to uh, reduce the emission in year 2000 and retain it to 1990 level. And we have a target, which is on reduce the emission and return to 1990 level. And we have a timetable which is the time year is about uh, is 20 uh, is 2000 that is why we call this target and timetable and for example that china also aimed to peak emission before 2030 and reduce carbon intensity by 60 to 65 percent by 2030 from 2005 year level so that is also a target and timetable the, the target is about peaking emission and carbon intensity timetable is on 2030. And United States aim to reduce 26 to 28% by 2025 from 2005. So the target is 26 to 28, and the timetable is 2025. And besides this target and timetable, there is also another approach called policies and methods. For example, the co example is not a target and not a timetable because of there is no quantified target on what is the percentage of phase down. And there's no timetable. We don't know how and when the code will be phased down. But that is about policy and methods we call PAMs, which countries will converge to use those policy and methods, especially on the code phase down approach. And one interesting issue is why China and other developing countries use what we call the relative emission target based on intensity. But developed countries such as US use a absolute term to absolute reduce the emission, uh, for example, 26 to 28. That this means developed country has more ambitions or not? We explain this, why developing countries choose relative mitigation contributions instead of absolute term. We argue that is not related to ambitions, is related to the national circumstances of developing countries, which is also a very important structure factor to shape the objective of developing countries. One of the key uh, characteristics of developing countries is they generally has high GDP growth rate. So which means uh, not only the, uh, the GDP growth rate is high, but also they suffer from this volatility of those GDP growth, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. And if they commit to uh, absolute reduction, which generally will have higher risk for their economy, we show this in the left figure that to say, if a developing country to commit to a absolute term of emission reductions, and then if they have a high GDP growth rate, then it's an expectation, they will suffer from a much higher carbon price or cost. And so, but if they, um, but if developing country committed to a intensity reduction, they can offset this GDP growth rate volatility and to reduce the risk on the cost. That's the basic reason that why developing countries prefer a form of carbon intensity or energy intensity instead of uh, absolute emission reductions. So the form of the of the objective or target has nothing related to the ambitions, but only reflect the national substance of developing and developed countries. And 
after the discussion of the actors, structures, and also the the um, objectives and also the actions, we can look at that the um, objectives within the context of sustainable development goals. We know that the climate change have huge implication on the sustainable development goals, which the country agreed to achieve in year 2030. And this is a table to show that the relationship between climate change with the SDGs, and you can show that generally the climate change impact almost all SDG goals, if not of them, but most of them. And this is important because of the climate change has been framed largely as development issues with multiple development objectives. Why it is this? Because of the scientific study shows that the climate challenge cannot be resolved through a narrow climate specific approach, right? Because of the climate have huge impact on other important social development objectives. So if you want to reserve the climate change, you must consider this within a broader context of social development, of social economic uh, development. And one example is the uh, impacts on the food security and anger, which is the two important SDG goals. The left figure shows that under the 1.5 degree scenarios, the uh, population in the risk of the anger, uh, of the hunger might be much higher. Why this happens? The region is basically because of, uh, to achieve 1.5 degree scenarios, we need a lot of negative emission technology, and we need to use much more land for produce biomass and to uh, implement those negative emission technologies. And then that will compete with food production and increase the food price and increase the risk for hunger and for uh, poverty. And we need to manage this within a broader context so that to avoid the trade-off between the climate change targets and other SDG targets. And that is why for developing countries, the development is also important uh, structure factors to shape and to constrain the emission reduction actions. And the, another dimension for this is at international level that we discuss this national governance within a national context. We discuss different actors, different actions, how United States and China form their target and how the form of those, those target is decided and how the structure factors constrain and shape their objectives. But inter international regime, that is also the case. And framing of the climate change is, is very important, especially that when we consider the interaction between national climate governance and international climate governance. There are two important framing for climate change at this moment. One is more economic uh, centric thinking, which is generally frame the climate change as a problem of managing global commons. The commons is generally a product or goods that you cannot prevent others from benefiting or suffering of that. For example, this carbon dioxide emission and the global atmosphere, which is a good example of the global commons. And the problem of the commons is the so-called tragedy of global commons, which means because of there is no ownership of this global goods, so the countries tend to overuse of those public goods. They emit too much greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere. And that is the tragedy of the global commons. And climate change is one uh, uh, example of this, this global commons. So that, that is the reason why we need 
international governance structure to manage this. And also that the international cooperation can benefit because of the mitigation costs and benefit is different in different countries. And the uh, right uh, uh, corner figure shows the different cost curve for different countries. You can see generally based on the uh, studies that the developing countries cost curve is much lower than developed countries. And the, the challenge of this framing is the free riding, which means some countries could uh, benefit from other countries' mitigation action, but without reducing greenhouse gas by themselves. And this free riding will, uh, um, will be a very important barriers for international cooperation, because of if that happens, no one would like to reduce their emission. They all want to be free rider. And that is why a cooperative action, which will increase ambition through the providing right incentives, because of it can avoid this free rider uh, problems. And another uh, framing for the climate change issues is the transition uh, framing, which generally focus on not only the global commons, but this frame argues that the key issues is how to accelerate our system towards a low carbon and SDGs. Because of the technology deployment is very much past dependent and to replace the old technology is time consuming. For example, the electricity power generation units has 30 years um, lifetime and once the power plant is built, it's very difficult to uh, change them. So we need to avoid past dependence and accelerate the transition. And that is the arguments of this frame. They frame this not, uh, not as uh, global common issues, but as how to accelerate the transition issues. So those two frame has huge implication. The first frame generally focuses on how different countries can work together to reduce greenhouse gas emission. So the greenhouse gas emission will be the focus. And second frame generally on how the international partners can work together to accelerate the transition. So the transition will be the focus. And to accelerate the transition also means you need to provide the means of the transition that in terms of provide finance, technology, that to make that low carbon transition happen as soon as possible. And those two different uh, framings have implication on the international governance and also on how we agree by using different agreement that to reduce our emissions. And all thinking is generally the example of Kyoto Protocol. And a new type of example is the Paris Agreement. And what is difference between those two international governance structures? Uh, in this table, we, we compare these two um, international agreements in different dimensions. But of course, there are many difference in many dimensions, but we just highlight some of them. For the Kyoto Protocol, which generally on the target and time frame, which give mitigation target by developed countries, which inscribed in the annex of Kyoto Protocol. And time frame is the two period of Kyoto Protocol. But for the Paris Agreement in the year 2015, we use the concept of national determined contribution. And we registered those NDCs, not within the treaty, but in the website of the UNFCCC. And why there's difference between the two arrangements. The region is generally because of, we understand that the ambitions international action build upon the ambitions national action. But national action is very much depends on national governance, including the national actors, national objectives, national process, structure factors, and also actions. So, 
if we follow the previous approach to use a top-down process to impose a target for the countries from the international negotiation, that will not make sense. And only a possible approach is to consider this autumn approach that to ask countries to propose their target based on their own national governance circumstance. And that is the basic reason why in the Paris Agreement, we use a different architecture. And of course, there are different terms of transparency, finance and market and compliance. And because of time limitation, we will not discuss this in detail. And so the key or the core elements of Paris Agreement is generally building upon this bottom up idea of NDC idea, which is country proposed and owned by the countries and they prepare, communicate and maintain those NDC by themselves. And they are not legally binding. The procedure to prepare, communicate and maintain NDC is legally binding. And those difference are very important difference in terms of legal nature. And also other key components, which including the update NDCs uh, informed by, we call the ratchet mechanism, which can allow countries to increase their ambitions over time. Because of, we have no guarantee to achieve the two degree or 1.5 degree. So we need to design a mechanism to allow countries to increase their ambitions over time so that we maintain the uh, uh, time window and hope to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. And why that um, the Paris Agreement take a so different governance structure uh, compared with Kyoto Protocol? We generally argue because of there are changing actors and structures and especially the geopolitical context. The developing countries became more and more important actors and also that the developing countries, their structural factors shape and constrain their governance. And we argue also that because of the changing stringency on emission reductions, therefore it will be more difficult for top-down approach. In the Kyoto Protocol area, it is the possible because of the emission reduction is not very stringent, but right now we only have very limited current budget and so the top-down approach to negotiate a target through international negotiations will almost impossible at this moment. And that is why we need to based on national determined approach. And also there is ongoing understanding on this important and complex interaction between international governance and domestic governance through the process action actor and objectives. But Paris Agreement is not perfect. There is criticism on this because of, as you have seen from the first slide that there is an emission gap. We are not still there. So the, um, uh, the argument generally said, we cannot guarantee the adequacy of NDCs to meet global goal. But when the response is yes, but we have those global stock take as ratchet mechanism to increase ambition over time, we will finally achieve that. But there's also a counterpart argument to say, even we can increase, which is not enough and not time. So why and how we can resolve this and respond to this counterpart argument on Paris Agreement? I think the answer is the provision of financial support is the key. If we have enough and timely financial support from developed countries to developing countries, that will incentivize enough and timely ambitions from both sides. But unfortunately, we have we, we, we lack of progress in climate finance. The last figures show the needs from, de from developing countries on mitigation. And generally, the most uh, conservative estimation is more than um, $250 billion every year. And even some countries argue it should be more than $1 trillion every year. And the right figures show that the climate finance today, and you can see that the goal has been set in year 2009 on 
a provision of about $100 billion to developing countries. But at this moment, there is only less than $80 billion. Uh, there is a gap that between the uh, financial provision and the support and the, uh, um, and the target. And there is also a huge gap between the 100 billion target and 250 billion needs and even 1 trillion billion needs. And so I believe that is the focus of future climate governance on this progress or provision of climate finance. And then I will spend a little time on this class of why bottom map not, not top down. You have seen this figure from the lecture uh, by Professor Luo Yong that generally there is a linear relationship between the temperature rise and the cumulative emission we can emit to the uh, atmosphere, we call the carbon budget, which means we only can limit, um, uh, we, we only can um, emit limited emission that to the uh, um, atmosphere. And for the two degree, we have generally about uh, 1,400 gigatons of carbon dioxide as carbon budget. But for 1.5 degree target, we only have about 500 gigatons of carbon budget. And given the current emission annually at this moment is about four, uh, 42 gigatons, so we will exhaust those 1.5 degree carbon budget within the next 10 years. And so the question is, can we divide that limited budget among different countries so that we can agree and we can guarantee to achieve the temperature goal because we can limit our budget as a whole? And the answer is very difficult. Why this is the case? because of we need to firstly agree on how we divide those limited pie, the principle to uh, divide that pie. And we have different principles. We could argue that historical responsibility because of that is the developed countries emit huge amount of greenhouse gas emission in the history. And so developed countries need to um, have less carbon budget in the future to balance their huge amount of emission in the history. We call it historical emission uh, principle. And this figure shows that the United States and European Union are the biggest historical contributor to the cumulative emission and developing countries have less responsibility. So if according to this principle, the United States need to reduce their em emission to zero emission right now, even negative emission right now. And United States simply cannot agree on this. And another principle could be equal burden sharing. So we equal our marginal cost and we consider this as an indicator for burden sharing. But that means developing countries such as China, India will reduce more emission. Why? Just remember that previous slides shows the cost curve of developing countries are much lower. And China, India definitely will not agree on this. And we also have other principles like ability to pay, equal right of all human, beneficiary pays. All of those principles give different allocation result. But all of those results are zero sum game because of one country, if want to have one tons of more current budget, which means another country's need to reduce their carbon budget by one ton. And it will be very difficult, extremely impossible in the international negotiations. And that is why within this so limited current budget, we cannot use this top-down approach we have used in Kyoto Protocol. We need to adopt bottom-up approach. And another uh, very interesting topic is about the process in the international uh, regime. Remember that we discussed why this uh, compromise of phase down and phase out happens in the very last minutes of the call. That is largely because of the consensus principles. In the, interna in the international negotiations, the countries use the principle of the consensus to make decision, which generally means all countries need to agree 
and then this will be adopted. And the chair will generally see around the room and see no objection. So he knocked down his um, grab and say, uh, I see no objection, so it is decided. Just look at that uh, uh, red figures, um, the small green hammers in the hands of uh, the chairs, which is generally to show the consensus has been made. So generally there's no voting uh, process in the climate negotiations. And what is different for those two decision-making process, the votings with the consensus? The consensus means every country can act as a veto power, means without um, the agreement from all countries who can't not make any decision, even small countries. So that gave the power of the countries to protect their interests. But of course, there's argument to say that is why the negotiation is not efficient because of there's so much red lines and every country want to protect their interests. So someone argued that is why the consensus is not efficient. But someone also argued it is efficient because of it is inclusive. It uh, respect the interests of all countries. So once you have made consensus, the countries can implement those within countries without difficulty because of it has been agreed on consensus. But if you base that on voting and there's no compliance procedures, then even you agree on some ambition target, you have no guarantee that countries will implement them within their countries. And that is why the consensus is important process in the international governance regime. And so in the very last minutes, I will discuss some emerging governance challenge in the future, which emerged from the Paris Agreement and also from the carbon neutrality target. The first one is the climate club, which generally I idea that to focus on this management of global commons. The idea is generally uh, to avoid this free riding issues by establish a volunteering group of countries to share membership benefits, such as trade benefit. And recently, the United States and European Union is considering this carbon border adjustment, which is uh, a possible uh, um, approach that for the future climate club. But whether or not this climate club makes sense is still in debate. So we need more research on this new governance forms. And second emerging challenge is climate risk governance that we see more and more debate on loss and damage and increasing climate risk on different countries and especially the tipping point and the cascading risk. And sometimes the risk is very uh, transnational risk. So how we can manage those risks across country boundaries, which is also emerging topic. And also the governance of transition that in the frame of the acceleration of transition, we have winners and losers, and we need to focus on just a transition and leave no one behind, especially the stranded access management and stranded community, which means the workers lose their jobs during the transition. And those governance issues also are emerging importance. And last but not least is governance of negative emission technologies. For example, if we have one CCS project in Japan, but they transport and store carbon dioxide in Russia and sell credit to the United States. So if there is a linkage, uh, if there is a leakage from the project, who should be responsible for the possible leakage? And that creates a lot of governance issues uh, and, and need an uh, answer. And so we go back to the uh, starting story of this debate on phase out and phase down. And we argue that we can use this actor structure process action goals framework to analyze this. So um, there is the players of uh, actors of China, India and the media and other countries and their process of negotiation consensus and the structural uh, factors constrain and shape the domestic policies and, inter and interaction between domestic policy and international policies. And so the current governance system from climate change generally in short is a national um, and international multi-sector and multi